Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. We welcome everybody back to Behind the Minbar Blueprints, inshallah, for a better masjid, uh, where, where we try to chart out what, uh, anything but a crash course, I guess, uh, for our masajid. I don't mean a crash course like an intensive, a crash course meaning how not to crash our masjids. We're trying to uh, level up in our masajid in terms of how to do better, not just how to uh, cover our bases in terms of the bare minimums, not just how to settle for business as usual. Um, and today, alhamdulillah, we have our, our latest victim at IECPA. <laughs> uh, we have our good brother, Daniel Khan, our new uh, executive director at the masjid. This is your... I'm a month and a half in, so um, almost two months. Okay, so still welcome. Still yeah. the honeymoon phase. Oh, yeah. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. Uh, may Allah Azza wa strengthen you and give you the, the stamina and the wisdom and the guidance mm -hmm. and the sincerity that will make this impactful for you and for the mm -hmm. community and for your loved ones and for your akhirah, for your hereafter. Allahumma ameen. Ameen. So how am I going to introduce you? So I never told you this, but you are officially now Daniel Christmas Lights Before Ramadan Khan. <laughs> you care to share the story or should I? Are you talking about from my pre my past uh, from my past or right now? Well, I'm that's already the funniest part. How many times have you done this? Tell uh, our viewers. So, um I'm very big on creating an experience. I feel like marketing is everything and displaying is everything. Um in one of my old jobs, I uh, decorated the masjid and um I decided to go bigger the next year and we had lights outside. And a community member comes back to me and says, uh, a convert, that, Brother Daniel, I need to talk to you. You know, I was coming for a fajr, and I was, you know, I was in the zone. And then I look at the front entrance, and I see all these Christmas lights, and it reminded me of my Christianity days. And, yeah, I got, I got a lot of, I got a lot of uh, feedback like that. But I and also got learned a, your lesson. No, because I got an <laughs> overwhelming amount of positive feedback and a bunch of youngsters coming and, you know, posting on Instagram and stuff like that. And I felt like that was that was definitely a win. So I'm doing it again. Here it goes again. <laughs> yeah. So for, for the for the backfill on this uh, six, seven weeks into his his work here at IECPA, one of the first things he's doing once again in the masjid is making sure there's a buzz for the upcoming month of Ramadan. May Allah deliver us, allow us to see it. Uh, and putting in these lights about the vibes. And that's actually our topic. That is the reason why I, I began with that uh, sort of uh, uh, jab at you in a, in a banter. I know you would accept sort of way. Alhamdulillah, our, our brotherhood has uh, has taken off in a lovely way. And I do appreciate you uh, in many ways and many more en route, inshallah. But for those who are new uh, to Daniel Christmas Lights Khan, let me... Uh, give you your due right. Daniel, alhamdulillah, is uh, certified in counseling, or he had gotten his degree in counseling, and then he went on to get his master's uh, in nonprofit management, which is such a huge niche. I mean, our, our hugely needed niche, should I say, more importantly. Uh, we had our brother Rami Qawas on the show, and he was speaking about one of the major challenges is people conflating, not being able to recognize the difference uh, between sort of the, the DNA of what a corporate for-profit business needs, and sometimes there's overlap, but there's also a gaping canyon between that sort of need and between what a non-profit, uh, let alone a non-profit religious uh, sort of enterprise needs. And alhamdulillah, you've been in both. Let me just uh, include that as well in the intro. You've been involved in relief work, you've been involved in national organizations. Alhamdulillah, you served as the CEO at one of the most active messages in the country at IAR, Islam Association of Rally, North Carolina. Um, and alhamdulillah, now you're serving here uh, with us. So in light of all of that, nonprofit management training, but also both sides of nonprofit management, the relief and the religious, let us focus on the religious for this episode, inshallah. And uh, in forthcoming episodes, maybe we can unpack other subjects. What do you think is, in terms of the vibe, obviously, and why it may not be appreciated by others or invested in by others, would you consider that one of the greater oversights? Like, what is the greatest oversight to you in Masajid that you try to prioritize shining light on when you get there? Um, one of the things that I have noticed about Masajids, at least uh, generalizing, right, is, and there's a lot of things that we can tackle, but the main one that stands out to me is the reactive way of working, hmm. right? I feel like a lot of the work that we do or have been doing has been very reactive. There's an issue, there's a pain point, we try to address it, and we come up with a band-aid or a solution. 
And um, from my experience, I've noticed that if you dig deeper, we realize that we're only addressing a symptom of the problem, right? Mm. So um, we need to switch, and we're seeing this, where people are taking a step back, taking a break, really trying to strategize and think about, hey, how can we be proactive? How can we be ahead of right the curb? Um, and that's what I'm trying to do here, too. Alhamdulillah. So uh, being more intentional, uh, yeah. uh, more about the why, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, there's this theory that a, a man called Simon Sinek came up with called the Golden Circle. And the Golden Circle basically talks about how all the work that you should be doing should come from your why. Um, and he from gives your a, wife? From your why. Oh, that <laughs> so, too? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there's a, and he, you know, usually when people talk about this stuff, they come from like a social or psychological uh, framework, right? Mm. He brings a biological argument that, you know, the way that our brain works is there's different, and I'm going to butcher this, but there's different parts of your brain that receive and process information differently, right? Mm. And one of the first ones is our emotions. Um, so his argument is that if we're able to connect on an emotional level, if we're able to uh, be united on why we're doing the work we're doing, um, then everything get everything gets built on on that. So like why, how, and what, right? Okay. Um, and we see this with a lot of work, right? We see, oh, mashallah, a lot of nonprofits that are doing well. They have a vision, and then they have a culture, and then they have an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing, right? So whenever there's like a shiny thing that's coming up or you know dangling in front of them, they don't get distracted, right? I think one of the biggest issues we feel experience in masjids in particular is we're trying to solve everything, all the problems, right? Uh, there was an imam that I used to work with. He used to say a lot that um, the masjid in the United States is doing the work of 15 different institutions that are happening overseas, right? So this is a real problem. And uh, that governmental institutions, I heard. Oh, yeah, well. governmental institutions. Yeah. yeah. So um, if we're able to take a, uh, a break, really just take a step back, you know, not really focus on the fires and focus on, hey, why are we here? Why are we trying to do the work we're trying to do? And then build off of that, you can be more intentional, more proactive, and you won't react as much. SubhanAllah, it's uh, one of our board members here at the Masjid, our brother Akbar, I've been trying to get him on the on the show, and hopefully uh, he's able to spare the time soon. Uh, he has a lot to share, a lot to offer, and one of the things he's uh, always been echoing is the notion that you can't have someone working in the business and working on the business at the same time. Yeah. Some people are going to have to have their heads down or else we're going to trip. Mm -hmm. Some people are going to have to keep their heads up or else like we're going to fall off the cliff. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I, I actually have, subhanAllah, uh, a few reflections here, but I do want to prompt you to speak way more than me. Uh, that one of the deepest things I even appreciated about Yaqeen Institute uh, is sort of the brand quality from a marketing perspective, but even the uh, the infrastructure quality. Mm -hmm. Like we we had a research retreat because the org had a reorg recently, and sort of how do you fit all of pe all the pieces into the new model? And yeah. so the, the researchers, most of them are remote. They're not like a lot of the tactical people on the inside, right? Yeah. And so we had to be flown down, and we had to really work through this on how we're going to like hit a home run with our actual intention, not just sort of like brute force, put yeah. out whatever you can put out yeah. uh, over the next three years. And after sitting through two days and amazing stuff happening, like at the back end, my single greatest reflection was what a blessing it was to just be able to stop, as you put it, yeah. pause, and say, hold on, what are we doing? Yeah. Why are we doing this again? Yeah. What's this going to lead to mm -hmm. if we continue doing this? Mm -hmm. In a good way even, right? Mm -hmm. It's not yeah. just like uh, the sky is falling type <clears throat> yeah. stuff, even in a good way. You know, and then uh, there are so many ayat in the Quran and a hadith of the Prophet that uh, if you actually stop and say, what's this about? You'll realize a big part of the why. Like, why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala have to tell us that he told Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim as salam and tahira bayti, purify my house for those who will pray in it? Like, why? Like, it seems like a day to day operation type thing, but yeah. there was intentionality there mm -hmm. that this place needs to be sort of presentable, it needs mm -hmm. to have a, it shouldn't have odor, it shouldn't yeah. have impurity, it should. And you think about like the, the average upkeep of a masjid and the yeah. vibe, right? Yeah. The atmosphere it has. Even to think even further, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that you will liberate the Masjid Al-Aqsa one day and whomever is able to send to it some oil for its lamps. 
Like, look at, subhanAllah, the visionary thinking of the why. Why? Because if it's illuminated, people will be there. They yeah. won't just be worshipping during the day. It'll be available yeah. to worship at night as yeah. well. And so the big why and ensuring the atmosphere is not some small issue, right? Yeah. Like, oh, no big deal whether there's, like, upkeep or not, whether there's conflict or not. People are still going to keep coming. Maybe they won't keep coming. Yeah. Maybe they, they will just keep coming at the bare minimum and the masjid will not serve the function mm -hmm. for which it was intended. Mm -hmm. So I guess that brings us to culture, right? Like masjid culture. What is a masjid culture? How do I identify what masjid, my masjid culture even is, right? Are you saying the why will obviously create an atmosphere yeah. and, a, and an intention and a game yeah. plan? Yeah. I'm imagining it will create even like a sort of a certain feel. It does. So the thing about starting with why is it gives you a direction, right? Mm. Um, and then it becomes very clear when we talk about execution of that why, who is going to buy in and who is not, right? So, for example, when we talk about visions of nonprofits, that's your why, mm. right? And um, the vision is supposed to bring, like, you know, people together. That I, uh, this is a banner that I can get behind, right? Um, and so, like, an example of, uh, of culture is, like, values, right? Um, and, you know, we see this in corporate, uh, corporate America and in, and, and, and in the nonprofit space, right, where there's all this big talk about, um, company culture, company culture. I feel like in the in the masjid space or in the Muslim space, right, because values are very important to us, not only in terms of our work, but in terms of just the way that we exist as a, as a, as a community or as individuals, that it's identifiable, right? And then we know, we know what are the, what are the consequences of it? Not bad consequences necessarily, but good, right? Because then this also shows who's going to be on the bus, but it also shows who needs to get off the bus, right? Um, there is a there is a thought leader named Adam Grant. He talks a lot about how there are givers and takers in pretty much any group dynamic, right? Mm -hmm. And one thing that he noticed is that it's not about how many givers you put in a group to see like the uh, the goodness come out of it, but it's also how many of the takers that you take out, right? And how do you determine you know who should get off the bus? The people who don't align with your values, so bringing it. So you might be a great yeah. fit for a different organization. Yeah, we're not necessarily saying fire yeah, or sort of dismiss exactly. people. Yeah, but just identify: is this part of what we're doing or not? Yes, yes. That's going to become secondary after identifying what am I trying to do? Yes, because we are all human, right? At the end of the day, we all have our shortcomings, right? That should not determine necessarily um, if you're a good fit for an organization or not. It ultimately comes down to: are you? Have you been bought in to the direction we're trying to go, right? Are our values aligned? Because if you cannot fundamentally agree, hmm. then everything that you're going to build off of that is going to be, it's going to be riddled with conflict and dis disagreements and stuff like that. So coming back to uh, masjid culture. So that's um, like the collective personality, if you will, of the masjid. Yeah, yeah. So how do we, is there a, like a litmus for this or how do we gauge, do we have like an aligned culture or yeah. is everyone in their own sort of, imaginary notion yeah. of what the masjid is supposed to be. Yeah, so culture in the masjid is a little finicky, right? Because it's not just employees that we're talking about, right? Yeah. Which most masjids don't even have employees, right? So we're talking about um, the 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 working environment, and then we're also talking about the beneficiaries, their experience, right? The best way to, to identify what your culture looks like is just simply asking and then getting the trends from those questions, the answers from those questions. So for example, we did a video for ICPA recently, right, where we asked um, people in the community, what is it that you liked about this masjid? And we asked them for you know, specific stuff. What we were trying to get was not, we were, we were trying to get like our wins. What we ended up getting was something, I think, more remarkable, which was how it made people feel. And, you know, like the, um, the, the, the average response we got was that it feels like home. It feels like um, I'm part of a bigger family. It's like a second home to me, right? When we're talking to parents and people who are seeing kids, they feel like kids are welcome, right? So from that, I, you know, even regardless of what, the, if I'm not able to identify what the culture is, I can at least tell that it's a healthy culture, right? Um, and non-healthy culture would be people not feeling welcome. People feeling like I, I, it's an obligation. I have to pray and I get out of there. Mm. People who are no longer involved in the leadership, they don't recommend the masjid, right? Or they, they leave the masjid and then they're like, yeah, there, do not go there, right? That's how you can determine what's a healthy or an unhealthy culture, right? We don't have any, like, uh, there's no research done on this, at least in the masjid front. I would love to see it or, you know, actively contribute to it. But 
in terms of like, you know, if we if we simplify masjid to family or a home, right? It's about if you ask people after they've been visited or they spend some time, how do they feel? That's how you're able to determine if it's healthy or not. Hmm. SubhanAllah. It's uh, perception is reality. How do they perceive it? Oh, yeah. Because you can say as much as we usually get into this echo chambers in the workplace where we'll say like, you know, oh, we're doing incredible work. But do your beneficiaries really feel that way? Hmm. Right. That's that's where you need to, you know, push yourself, work with Ihsan, try to up it up and, you know, gauge and really see because, you know, you'll realize that most times there's two different realities, right? They're the people who are heavily involved in Meshid that will, um, you know, for the most part, they'll be like the brand ambassadors. Oh, I love this place. This place is mm. great. But then you talk to someone who maybe casually comes and they're from their perspective, this place is not so great, right? So um, being able to get like, you know, on the work from the employee side, from the board side, from the other leadership, active volunteer side, and then from a general community member who's just coming to pray and attends some of the services. If we're able to, you know, ask them and get responses and then look at trends, right? Then we can see where our culture is. And ultimately our culture should be aligning with our values, right? Yeah. If you are a welcoming masjid, I would discourage you from yelling at children, right? That's something that your mushroom probably should not be doing. Um, you know, like you will see like seminaries and academic centers that focus on higher education would probably not be as acceptive or receptive to children shouting in the musalla, right? Or children shouting in the hallways, right? But a masjid that has an Islamic school needs to be more merciful towards the children because that's part of your values. If you're claiming that you want to be the youth's masjid, right? Um, we need to make sure that the experience for youth and the people who are bringing the youth is youth centric. Right. right? Subhanallah. Uh, so many things are going off. I remember Imam Zaid Shakir, Hafidahullah, uh, may Allah protect him and bless him. Uh, he has this famous statement that has actually, I, I've seen that it, I was not the only person who latched onto it. Like, I'm going to keep hearing it three surface in other circles. It's just, uh, you know, inspiration from Allah Azza wa Jal. He just put it together so well. He said, come to Islam as you are. Come to come as you are to Islam as it is. It's wonderful, right? Like, we're not asking you to be angelic, but let's let's agree on the ideal. Yeah. You know, it's supposed to be promoting your values yeah. while offering a very clear, welcoming atmosphere and mm -hmm. inroad mm -hmm. that should be easily noticeable. Mm -hmm. I remember uh, Sheikh Abdullah Oduro, uh, we were speaking in the context of uh, how welcoming our masajid were. And, you know, some, uh, Sheikh Omar actually, Suleiman, said to me uh, that they have a very nice atmosphere in Valley Ranch Islamic Center, where Sheikh Yassir Birgis lead, leads, and Sheikh Omar Suleiman is a resident a scholar there as well. And he said, I said to him, it's crazy how, you know, you might see some non-Muslims, like we're going even one step further now, attend Jummah on some messages around the country. But you guys actually have non-Muslims attend your night programs, your Saturday yeah. lecture, I was there for like an evening program, not a Jummah. And he said, Muhammad, that's the way it should be. I'm like, yeah, yeah but are our masajid ready for that? Yeah. And then Sheikh Abdullah Oduro added, uh, he's in Dallas as well. He said, well, it all starts even before the doors of the masjid, Muhammad. It, uh, the average non-Muslim, if they want to come to your masjid, they're probably going to Google you. They're probably going to land on your YouTube channel. Yeah. How would they feel? How welcomed versus alienated or apprehensive would they feel from perusing your YouTube? Yeah. And I was like, that's actually a great point. And, and then on the inside... Uh, uh, I was told secondhand, but it, it sounds like something he would have said, uh, that uh, Sheikh uh, Ubaidullah, Ubaidullah Evans from Chicago, uh, he was speaking at an MSA, and this is an MSA, right? You're supposed to be a much wider net even than the Masajid. Uh, this is a wider society. And he was telling the crowd, do you know what my issue is with you? He said, your BHI is way too high. And everyone's like, what's the BHI? <laughs> he made it up, I think. <laughs> you know, the BMI, the body mass yeah. index of like yeah. how much body fat you have? Yeah. He said, your beard hijab index is way too high. Meaning like, there must be a reason. You guys didn't put it on the flyer. Yeah. That if you don't have a beard, don't come. You don't yeah. have a hijab, don't come. Yeah. Uh, and so we're not saying that sort of these are not teachings yeah. of Islam. But we're saying how much room do we give people to feel welcome to grow in our space when they're yes. not there yet? Yes. And, you know, you, you mentioned the fact that don't think I'm talking about boards or employees, even yeah. just they're on the receiving end oh, perception. Yeah. Yeah. Why is that? Like, can you like because it's not a given for everyone. Why are people more important than, dare I say, places? Yeah. Right. Like, 
a lot of times we get real, you know, uh, invested in the place yeah. and building out the place. Yeah. But then the the people and the people's experience and the people serving, uh, we may not pay as much attention to. That's a very good question. And I could spend a lot of time talking about this one. I feel like when it comes to our institutions, succession planning is basically non-existent. And I'm talking about like masjids in particular, right? Um, I, we, we see a trend of like people feeling engaged, right? It's heavily, heavily engaged when they're very young because their parents are making them do it, right? right? Then they either get to high school, college level. Let's say they even survive there. That's, that means you're doing good at a mush, uh, from a masjid standard today, right? If you're able to retain high school, college. Right, for but, sure. Th- because most people are not able to. So if you're doing that, great. But it's not enough because now we have a problem where we have folks between 20 to 30, or I would even argue 20 to 40, who are basically non-existent. They get married. Priorities change. When do they get back in? They get back in when they have kids. And those kids need to go to an Islamic school. Then they're in the board, and they're here, and they're there. And if they, they, come, back, if they, they come, come back, they come back yeah. then. Yeah. That's when they come back. Yeah. So we have a gap, right? And we're seeing this gap in donations, we're seeing this gap in volunteerism, we're seeing this gap in community engagement, right? Um, I feel like, and there, I know that there was actually a a Christian pastor who said this. I, I'm forgetting the name. He used to talk a lot about how we're supposed, it's important that we are, it's important to recognize that we are in the business of people, right? And that is what drives our communities, right? Just take Take a community, and it's a bunch of individuals that come together, right? If you build a building and hope that the place is going to fill up, it might not happen. And we're seeing this with a lot of churches, right? I'm seeing it at Masajids. I'm seeing big, beautiful buildings that look like museums, right? They're very beautiful, and nothing is happening. The only people who are involved are like the kids or the families of the people who built the Masjid, right? right? And that's a problem. I, We need to focus on building the experience and investing in the experience and like even professional background of like youth and people of different kinds of backgrounds so they can we can cultivate the love of them right once we cultivate cultivate the love regardless if they take a step back they move they will always reflect or refer or come back to the masjid where that love is there so we don't necessarily have to worry too much about you know the succession planning there, right? Because we know that it will eventually we'll get the return of investment long term. I'm not seeing that, um, at least in the masjid space today, right? There are some masjids that are doing it now, but I feel like we're we're really behind. And because of that, we have this generational gap. And I think, you know, uh, realizing the uh, the power of the socialization, you know, socialization, we always talk about it like in the brainwashing sense, social conditioning, but there is a social element towards sort of staying somewhere. Yeah. I mean, more than anything else. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Hatim al-Hajj, he he once pointed out that when Allah Azza wa Jal said that Ibrahim alayhi salam called out uh, the pagans on their social reasons, which are, of course, unacceptable for choosing something wrong, uh, he said, you only accepted this sort of like indefensible idea of like a statue being God because of, instead of God, because of the social warmth, the social bonds between yeah. you. And so he's saying, he called them out on this. But on the flip side, we should, uh, I don't want to say weaponize this, we should har- harness this yeah. for the for the truth, not for, yeah. for falsehood, right? Yeah. There, there's a social component, like why do we have to tend Jummah anyway? Of course, Jummah is not everything. It's like a bad marker for a healthy yeah. community. Oh, they have to be there, even if they yeah. hate you and hate the yeah. masjid. But uh, why didn't Allah say just reach with a kef, make yeah. sure, and that's mandatory? No, being there in the Jummah is 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 necessary. So you're saying people are important, feeling welcome is important, and people being sort of dedicated in the masjid are the way to bring people back. They remember yes. what a thriving masjid looks yes. like. It's the good experiences. Because it's of the, the good, experiences. Yes, and investing in people can be in many ways, right? So, for example, we see examples of masjids where they invest in youth to go abroad or, you know, get into seminaries, and um, they come back as imams, right? Um, a good friend of mine. Um, so thinking long-term succession plan. Yes. Prepare yes. the leadership. Don't just yes. wait so, for it to land. Because that's what we do. We import, right? Um, I'm an import technically, right? Like, But it would, in an ideal case scenario, people would grow up in that community and, you know, all the hard work that the leadership of the past put in would 
bear fruits in the form of them being actively engaged, replacing them in leadership, right? Like that would be the ideal case scenario, mm -hmm. which we need to strive for. But in, other than active roles, just having a connection to the masjid, because that justifies expansion. We cannot justify expansion by there's a bunch of people moving to the community. We justify expansion by like organically, incrementally, right? By, hey, we have this many people attending our active services, not our events. Events are not a good benchmark. That's a benchmark of determining how many people are in the community, not how many people love the masjid or actively involved in the masjid. We see that with the reoccurring services, the halakas, the classes, and stuff like that. Based off of that, we determine, okay, should we expand? Expand doesn't happen first. Expand should always happen second. Right. So people come and they're they're bought in. The experience yeah. is good. And yeah. otherwise, yeah. obviously, they come from a place of sincerity. A lot of times, yeah. we should always uh, fact check ourselves, yeah. at least not yeah. others, about our intentions. Yeah. But presumed sincerity, but certainly no presumption here. Passion. Yeah. Pa too many passionate people in one place yeah. without the proper safeguards or alignment yeah. on the why and stuff creates conflict. So let yes. me let me curve bullet that way. Yeah, what do we do now when we have a lot of people in the masjid? good problem to have but yeah. how do you mitigate now conflict which could basically let out all of that vibe that you worked so hard to build and the yeah. activity brought people because of the vibe but now they yeah. can have a sort of adverse reaction which is yeah. that you you implode yeah. the vibe the, you can have nice smells and nice carpets and smiles yeah. but if we all know there's tension you can cut it with a knife the air yeah. is thick yeah uh how do we mitigate conflict i know there's many layers to this but whatever layer you want to take it yeah. I think that would be a huge service for like people listening in on yeah. what are the biggest reasons for conflict maybe, what are some very practical tips on avoiding, remedying conflict. Yeah. Bismillah. Yeah, no, you can dissect it in many ways, right? I feel like as someone who's working as um, an executive director, from my point of view, I have to think about how well and how effectively as an institution, but also as like just leaders and individuals, are we communicating our expectations, who we are, are we aligned in the values, right? This stuff is all, this, the, all this stuff builds off of one another, right? So if we're not aligned in the values, right, for example, our why, then you give room to someone to come and hijack your why, right? We see a lot of cases where um, certain programs that were never like in the forefront of an organization becoming in the forefront because two or three people came and just hijacked the vision. Right. Um, and you don't even mean maliciously. You no, just not like yeah. there was room. So we yeah. filled it. Yeah. So I, I want to disclaimer, right? None of this is malicious. Right. I would like to believe that there's an abundance of sincerity in our work. Right. Because like you forget about Muslims for a second. Just humans who get involved in certain industries tend to be givers. Right. Teachers, social workers, nurses. Right. And community workers, like uh, uh, welfare and social workers, right? So in this case, we're talking about masjids. Givers tend to be abundant, right? So ikhlas is never, I would like to believe that's not questionable. Ihsan is where it becomes questionable in our work, right? And I have a personal model that- Sophisticated and yeah, excellent. And I have a personal team model that I promote in every team that I'm working is to serve, serve, not lead. Serve with ihsan and ikhlas, right? You, and there's a bunch of things that fall underneath them. So bringing it back to the conflict, if we're not communicating effectively, so conflict is inevitable. You're working with people, you're not working with the robots, there's gonna be conflict, right? They're not the inert objects. Yeah, right? conflict yeah, yeah. is not the problem. The problem is how do you react to that conflict? Whether you're an individual with your family or you're a volunteer engaged in the masjid or you're a leader that is responsible for policy and process making, right? So to me, if my vision and mission is not, number one, if my vision and mission and values, are not clearly communicated, I allow people to come and bring their own flavor to it, right? And that's So we're not even, I just want to highlight, we're not even talking about not having a why, which most people don't. Yeah. We're talking about you put in the work, yeah. you really were thoughtful about yeah. getting that why together, you sacrificed the time to make yes. the why, but yes. you never trickle affected it. You never yes. socialized it to the yes. rest of your group. Because then what's going to happen, you're going to retire or leave for whatever reason, and a new group is going to come in and completely take over a whole different way. Again, not maliciously, right? But it's 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 a game. And that's what deflates volunteers, yeah. subhanAllah. Oh, like, it does. I, I'm talking about what I hear from other organizations yeah. even. I'm not sort of, I know the, the liability of this podcast yeah. is everything is assumed to be an internal experience. Yeah. And it's not. We yeah. just have our ears to the ground because exactly. we work here. Yeah. But like from colleagues and otherwise, I swear this one is an ICPA. Yeah. It isn't. Uh, but like every time there's like an ele election cycle, uh, 
you know, there's like a turnover in yeah. leadership. Yeah. The owners of the Y. Yeah. Assumed. And then the the dedicated workers like, come on, man, I just put four years yeah, of, yeah. of build. Yeah. And all of a sudden saying, we're not doing that, we're doing this. Yeah. That you can, like, even if you've bought into someone else's yeah. why, yeah. I'm not sort of like a, here, turn yeah. left, now turn right. No yeah, human yeah. being will accept that. Yeah, and this is why That's we huge. have to reframe our way of thinking and leadership in the Muslim space from uh, people, champions to facilitators, right? Our job is to be stewards of the good work, not to own it and lead it like technically, like we, it's not our place to decide the direction, right, of a community center. We're calling it a community center. It's the community that benefits from that community collectively, right, through their pain points and their experiences that we determine this is, you know, based off of this, we're going to prioritize this. Because then when we allow that, when we when we decide, okay, this is the direction we're headed, within reason, right? Islamic Islamic framework, right? Um, the, uh, the culture and everything else that's going on. You had to think about technology, politics, social, everything that's happening in your area. When you understand your limit, you welcome partnering organizations and masjids to take over the other slices of the pie, right? Mm -hmm. And collectively, we become, I think, one of the speakers in the past talked about the, the Muslim village, right? That's how we become that. Wait, wait, you, you, you listen to I our listen podcast? I listen to the podcast, yeah. So, uh, so, that's, so the first thing is to make sure we are transparent with our why. Number two is how do we disseminate that communication-wise, right? Um, on a, from an from a employee and volunteer perspective, I try when I'm working with people, um, because I, I ha, I've had many disagreements in terms of my approach and work and stuff like that. I can come off as maybe a little too corporate or a little too ambitious, right? That's fine, right? Um, but it's where is that coming from? When someone challenges me, right, and we, I can maybe call that a, a conflict, I choose not to. Uh, I try to come, I try to look at, okay, this is not me versus them, and I'm trying to prove them wrong. This is an opportunity for both of us to learn. So we are on the same page, and we have a problem. We need to solve it together, right? So one, shifting your, your uh, two, shifting your, your framework on how you address the conflict. Me coming from someone, from a leadership, in a, in a leadership role at a masjid, I need to be open to people questioning me, criticizing me, disagreeing with me. Right? Maybe even inviting it. Yeah, yeah, it has to be invited, right? Because some people are maybe intimidated, right? Right. So giving like uh, different forums, different opportunities, micro, mezzo, macro, meaning like one-on-one, one-on-ten, -on -one, one -on one-on-a-hundred, right? These need to be accessible. So what does that look like? That is that like a regularized check-in? Is that sort of an all hands? Because just, I know you, you may think that everyone knows oh yeah, yeah. Uh, all of this stuff but a, a lot of us are, are just uh, learning on the job and yeah. hoping you know we can make the best out of it myself yeah. included yeah um, so what does that look like so very well, practically speaking yeah. someone else wants to make sure I don't lose my my most dedicated volunteers yes. I don't rub them the wrong way I don't yes. bump heads unintentionally yeah uh, what's a healthy uh, dynamic to make sure communication lines are opened and promoted so um, this is a good question. I'm going to actually quickly tell a story, and then I'll give some actionable steps. I remember um, I was having a team meeting in one of my old jobs, and I was sharing with the team. We had like a monthly meeting, and we skipped a few because it was really busy, which usually happens during Ramadan time. And uh, shortly after Ramadan, like I feel like maybe two months in, I had a team meeting. And I said that, well, you know, I have an open-door policy, right? my ignorant self, like, you know, I was like, oh, you know, but I'm available, I'm open, right? And one of my employees said, Brother Daniel, hey, that's not enough. You should not only be having the door open, you need to meet us where we're at, come out of your room, right? And this is very theoretical, like, you know, he, what he's trying to say, what he was trying to tell me was, you need to meet us where we're at. Get in the trenches. And ha yeah, and have a conversation, yeah. right? Because not everyone's going to know Right. Because he trusts me to be able to give me this feedback. Right. But he's speaking on behalf of folks who don't trust me. Right. We don't have that transparent, that level of communication. Right. So the point he was making was very valid. Right. And I had to really reflect a lot into that and, you know, refine my way of working, um, which Being is more v visible. Yes. Probing, initiating, you know, meeting people where they're at, not just assuming that they can come to you because there's, you know, there's different dynamics at play and we got to be respectful and, and just be realistic of it, right? We can't pretend that, oh, you know, but we're all friends, we're all family. No, we're not, right? Uh, at the end of the day, there are dynamics, even within the family. So actionable steps, 
once you have your vision, mission, and, uh, and values aligned, right, it's important that you socialize them, right? They should not be changing every year. They should be the same. You create parameters and for employees and active volunteers on how you can, how you can communicate. So different forums, uh, all hands, individual check-ins. There's a tool called 15.5, which I think is great. It does like a company pulse thing. So something like that, right, getting a, getting a pulse to understand where we're at whether it's negative or positive, it's okay, right? That's the reality, right? Do you have like an, an open time where anyone can schedule a meet with you? Yes. So one of the things that I did, um, I used to hear a lot in the past about um, Brother Daniel was not available and he, and I would be in the masjid all day. So I'm like, what do you mean I'm not available? I'm here all day. I spend more time here than I do at home, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so to solve that, I realized that the office hours was not working. Right. Because I would have office hours and you mean no the one, physical physical office. hours, oh, Yeah. Physical, okay. Right. So like people would not show up. You're right? fiddling your thumbs. inside. Yeah. Of I'm just sitting in the office. Yeah. I'm just waiting. So instead, I decided to, you know, use leverage technology. I created a Calendly account, had a QR code, have it on my signature um, where it's actively adaptive, adaptive, like it adapts to what signature, my schedule. You mean like the end of it, your Yeah, emails. my email. Right. You're, and then also like have a QR available so like people know that they can book here my whole team knows about it right it's meant for community members and team members and anyone basically on top of the regular proactive check-ins that i'm doing right because this is an example of people meeting me where i'm at i also need to be doing the check-ins and stuff and meet them where they're at right so one thing that so what we do you know if you limit like for example two to four hours a week you keep your Friday completely available. That's one of the things I do. I try not to schedule any meetings on Friday. Um, and I stay at the Meshid as much as I can during the day and night, the high volume times. One of the things I used to like about IAR, for example, is the Imams would stand after every Juma. They would stand outside and greet everybody. And I would just stand with them. You know, most of the time people wouldn't come to me. They would go straight to the Imams. But there were times where people would have questions for the imams that were re- relevant to me. So then they would be like, oh, our, our CEO is right here. You know, like, why don't you go speak to him? And then This is a I logistical would, or executive yeah, question or yeah. whatnot. This okay. is an example of meeting people where they're at, you know, instead of just waiting in your office or just going running out right right after Salah, standing there and being present, being available. That's actually very, you know, uh, easily overlooked. Yeah. Like you think about it, it is... Not even figuratively, it is physically actually acrobatics to get past all of those ranks to get to the guy in the mihrab after Jumu'ah. Yeah, yeah. Like only if you're not on the first row, you're gonna. If miss you're it. not on the first row, you're gonna be like, I can't walk over everyone's shoulders. Oh yeah. So the imam sort of saying he may not be able to get to the masjid. Yeah. He may not know my email or otherwise. Yeah. And him to try to sort of put himself in a place yeah. where there's foot traffic. Yeah. To say I'm here for you. Do you need me? Yeah. As opposed to. Yeah. <laughs> I hope they don't come. Yeah. I, I mean, un, uh, non-verbal. No, so no I know. I know what you it could mean, give yeah. off that vibe. Like, yeah. The most I have important, barricades. The most important thing is that it exists. Even if people, I hear this a lot from people. It's like, well, you know, no one shows up. No one does this. It's like, it's, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if people don't show up. Like, one of the things I got from the old guard, a lesson that I learned the hard way, was it doesn't matter if people don't show up to the team meetings. Always have them. Put it on the calendar. It doesn't matter. Because you don't want to be in a position when the conflict arises right where the parameters are not set in place you're setting yourself up for failure right right so bringing it back to conflict right if we uh conflict should stay within the parameters what that means is like we we need to identify where's the conflict coming from so um i I can give you a, a good example um work has been getting done a certain way for many years and then it completely changes, Change in process. right? I, I don't know. And that can cause friction because yeah. it's like I'm so used to it, and we're 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 creatures of habit, right? This no one likes to change their habit. And if you're talking about folks who are older and they're used to it, it's it becomes harder, right? So and I've seen it open the door for uh, just I know it's yeah. uh, this is a moral issue. This is not just sort of like perspectives that you when you jump to faulty assumptions, too bad. But I do see it like clockwork, creating faulty yeah. assumptions, like. You guys are overcomplicating it. You guys are yeah. trying to act all this, yeah. that, the third. Or, yeah. Uh, you know, stop corporatizing everything. Yeah. We're supposed to be anti-establishment anyway. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, it depends on your political alignment, right? But yeah, I actually have seen that myself. Yeah. And the thing is like... It's a simple change. Yeah. And the people creating the change may actually be in the right. Like there's no yeah. way to scale this organization without yeah. automating that yeah. or sort of updating this. Yeah. But because it is new, even yeah. if you communicate it, yeah. it still may meet resistance. Yeah. And let's say let's say the people who are, who are leading are in the wrong, right? If the people 
who are leading are in the wrong, they need to be flexible, right, in the parameters, right? So, for example, if it's a policy that's been happening for a long time and now we're just implementing it, right, that shouldn't change, mm. right? It's about how can we make it easy for you to, you know, implement the policy, right? But if it's a new policy and you know it's going to change the way the, the, the org works or operates, Ease it in. Yeah, ease it in. Spend the time. Get people's input. Because when you're just telling people what and how, and you're not talking about the why, you're refusing buy-in. You're closing the door for feedback and communication, right? Then I remember when we implemented uh, in this message uh, OKRs, Objectives and Key Results. And, you know, it's a corporate term. Sounds like some, you know, like, I don't know, posh acronym or something yeah. that you're trying to be aristocratic yeah. or something Some to some people, right? Yeah. And they were like, you know, why do we have to complicate things? And, yeah. you know, why do I have to sort of break it down in this way? And I'm not even great at this yeah. model yet. I'm still learning from you and from even the, the previous board members who uh, introduced it. Yeah. But as soon as, I'm just going to say the collective we, uh, the people that were most resistant received the explanation of why this is in your best interest to operate like this. Yeah. And they were given a reasonable amount of time to sort of yeah. get onboarded with it. Yeah. Everything went away. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. Yeah. It's true. You're absolutely right. Like, yeah. I don't see it. I don't see why. I know what yeah. I'm supposed to do, but I don't see why do we, I never did this before. Yeah. And it seems, <clears throat> you don't know what you don't know, right? Yeah, It exactly. seems like it's pointless just going through the motions to yeah. look like a big business. Yeah. Then you realize, oh, I'm not going to be able to justify my budget mm -hmm. to the donor, mm -hmm. which means I'm not going to have a budget. Mm -hmm. And the board is working to get me my budget. Mm -hmm. But unless I have it this way, this like, okay, then I'll do it. We don't have direction. I'll do it. We don't have we do, we don't know how to measure impact. How do we know we're doing a good yeah. job? Right? These things help there, right? But I get it. I understand. They're new. Mm. They sound corporate. They sound tedious. But this so they is need what, explanation. Yeah. And my and point was that they, 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 yes. people deserve an explanation. Communication. Yeah, yeah. Communication, right? So like the communication within the framework is so important, right? Um, I don't know what like the audience looks like, but if assuming if the audience is on the leadership side, it's important that you stay flexible. It's important that when you're introducing new things that you do a good job sharing the why before the decision is made. Don't make the decision and then share the why, mm. right? Share the why behind the argument so then they can you allow your team members to give their feedback and then you can refine your process. Can I ask you, because as yeah. time is winding down, I don't know if this maybe deserves a whole episode on its own. Uh, but they can also get it from like a, a marital counseling episode, <laughs> not from this podcast. But the idea of like locking horns, like uh, the, the, I'm sure you have experience where all of this parameters are in place. Uh, you communicated or you didn't. The point is yeah. we got to this point of, yes. you know, uh, a standoff, yeah. hostility. Yeah. Um, Allah forbid yelling. Allah yeah. forbid, you know, worse than that. Yeah. Uh, have you ever had to de-escalate from this and how did you do it? Yeah. So, um, I, so from my perspective, right, from my point of view. Because some people, you know, like begrudgingly just like say oh, their yeah. peace and walk away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or they'll murmur in the shadows. Yeah. Other people will be like, no, this is Allah's work. Yeah. And I'm going to put you in your place to make sure yeah. you don't sabotage it. And they yeah. sort of, <laughs> yeah, they take on the, the, the David and Goliath romanticized. There's a, there's uh, a story that I'm going to refer here. I think it's called, um, uh, Dragons Don't Exist. Have you heard of it? Have you heard of the story? Uh, from you, I think, but I don't remember so, anything about it. So the story basically is along the lines of there's a small dragon in the house with kids. It's a it's a it's a it's a it's a kids book, and it says that um, the kid is basically telling mom that hey, there's a dragon in the house, and the mom does not believe it, and the dragon continues to grow and grow and grow, mm. and it makes life hard to live in the house, and eventually it gets so big that it ends up taking the house away, right? But as soon as they identified that it was a dragon, it started getting slower, lower, smaller, 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 until it became into a manageable size, hmm. right? This happens in families, that happens in groups, it doesn't matter, it happened to people. When you don't address a problem, when you see it, it needs to be seen, it doesn't just disappear. It will grow and grow and grow and it comes out till we unfortunately get to points where there's no discussion and it just needs to be de-escalated, de right? And when I think of de-escalation, I'm thinking, okay, there is no way for me to have a conversation with this person. This person is not seeing Brother Daniel. This person is seeing something that Brother Daniel represents. I was so you're a, the dragon. I'm the dra I, or there's a dragon be be between us, but we're not able to. Like, Dang, I yeah. wanted to demonize you. <laughs> so I'll give you a real example, right? My first month into one of my jobs. Uh, the vaccines came out and, um, you know, they were allowing vaccines for the elderly in the first wave and uh, for, for COVID. Um, and then there was a there was a situation where 
volunteers were allowed to get vaccines, but um, uh, we were not allowed to let the volunteers know. And uh, so, th so, so we were not incentivizing people to volunteer for that event. I'm new in the team. I don't understand the dynamics. I don't have trust, right? I can communicate, say all the fancy words I want, but I don't have trust. Um, so someone in the team lets it out, tells their buddies, active members of the who have been volunteering in that community for a very long time come are saying that they're volunteers. I find out from some of the doctors, I panic. I go to um, I go to the individuals. So they were volunteers. They're volunteers in general, not in volunteering general, for the event. Not for the event, so they're ineligible for the they're vaccine. They're ineligible for the vaccine. Got it. So they come. It's very clear that they're not volunteering. They're sitting in the gym. I come and I see it as I'm coming. Right. I see from their body language that they're. This is going to be. A, there's going to be conflict here. Right. As soon as I came, one of the brothers gets up, starts like poking at my hip body right he's like you know who are you to tell me i've been in this community longer than you oh i've my. been alive all this kind of stuff right the other brother is like just tell me i've been wasting my time i'm a busy guy can i get the vaccine or not i looked at this person right now let me guess yeah because you're trained in marital counseling uh, maybe you went to the car and got your bet no <laughs> <laughs> i uh i i looked at them and i realized there is no discussion with this person right of course, now of course it i had to de-escalate the yeah. first thing i did was right i put my hand on the brother's uh, uh, shoulder, you know, because we're brothers, I have that privilege. I was able to do that, right? If it's maybe our brother sister altercation, that's not going to happen, right? I put my hand on him and I, to I lowered my tone. I showed him that we're safe, right? By my body language, I did not respond in the same aggressive or even more, which we tend to do because we get triggered or we get offended. It's like, whoa, 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 why are you accusing me? It's not about me now. The story's not about me. It's their story, right? And as a leader or it's someone... what they're perceiving of yes, you. That's all that matters. Yes. And I know that they're mm. there. It's it's something that they see that is probably not true, but I need to get them to get there. But first, I need to get them down, right? So I said, look, brother, I am really sorry. Can you... I feel like there's a misunderstanding. What... Tell me more. What are you... Like, what's going on, right? He explains the whole thing. I find out what the problem is. I'm like, look, if I were you, I would be upset too, like you, you're a busy guy. You have your business to run. You've been here for a long time. So I understand. This is exa This is the rules, right? I didn't make them. I'm very sorry that they're inconvenient, right? Um, but I want you to know why we're enforcing them, right? And if if circumstances were different, or if this was, or you know, like whatever the case was, we would deal with it differently. Immediately, I saw a flush of embarrassment, right? Because I know this is not this person's character. I know that this is not who this person is. They just behaved in a way that they needed to behave to communicate what they felt, right? What are they feeling? Probably feeling that, you know, people just make rules. Probably as someone who's been involved in the community for a long time, not feeling heard or involved anymore or, or important, right? These are real things that people can feel. And we tend to do that. When, as we're seeing the increase in the younger generation in the meshed, we're seeing a neglect of the older folks, right? And that's not okay. They need to, we need to, it's not that their time is up. Their time is not up. They just switch from individual contributors to mentors, to advisors. They still have their role, right? Um, so, and even yeah. if they didn't, yeah. I mean, the verse is about parents, but it yeah. applies to every elder, really. Lower the wings. Yeah of humility to them yeah. out of mercy just have yeah. mercy just on have them. mercy yeah you know like yeah. said, we are not sort of utilitarians yeah. or like you're, you're a cog in the engine yeah, yeah. in the industrial world yeah. and once you finish your utility sort of yeah. like we are muslims we yeah. are believers when that's very important when you know you like deep down you realize that usually it's never personal there's something else that's going on especially when the response does not equal from you know logically speaking the issue that there's something deeper and I, I would, They're having I, a bad day. Yeah, anything. They're misunderstanding what you represent. Yeah, but you need to do everyone. This is a lesson yeah. to everybody, not only leaders, but you just need to take the time to think about, okay, where is this coming from? And then is it worth it, right? Is it worth the conflict? Is it worth the struggle, right? If it's a policy thing and you're a leader and you have to hold yourself accountable to that standard, fine. Just make sure that you reinforce and reemphasize that this is not personal. This is what it is. But not before you bring them down. You bring them down. That's yeah. right. SubhanAllah, it's... Uh, there's a lot here, but communicating to begin with, just never allowing it to, so we're not talking anymore. Yeah. Don't ever let it get there. Yeah. I mean, uh, that's when, you know. Uh, that's when the dragon's too big. That's when the dragon's too big. Yeah. SubhanAllah. And you just, you see them as the, the worst embodiment of yeah. what you think. Yeah. They are, SubhanAllah. And 
uh, you know, I was reflecting as you were speaking about anger and the, the Prophet والسلام, when he came to Medina, he was openly challenged, insulted yeah. uh, by the man who became eventually yeah. the head of the hypocrites. He wasn't even Muslim yet, but the head of the hypocrites. And like he said some very insulting words. Yeah. And the Prophet والسلام, you know, he continued, he walked away. Yeah. Uh, and he he de-escalated the situation because people rose yeah. to his defense. Yeah. It's a well-known hadith, yeah. uh, but it's a lengthy one. He de-escalated those that were about to retaliate in his name, and yeah. then he left. Yeah. But he was still hurt. Yeah. And so he, he had continued on his journey to visiting Sa'd ibn Ubad, radiallahu anh, and he said to Sa'd ibn Ubad, as soon as he walked in, did you hear what Abu Hubab said? And the scholars point out like the beauty of his characters, all them, that in his absence now, he didn't say like that jerk or something right he said yeah. what abu hubab the father of like he even maintained his honorific yeah. of respect yeah. in private yeah on the day he insulted him yeah and then saad ibn Ubaid said to me ya rasulallah just let him go yeah he to your point it's, it was something bigger he's saying yeah. they were literally finalizing his crown yeah. to be the king of medina when you showed up yeah right and so the prophet actually did he yeah. like had mercy on yeah. how difficult it must have been to yeah. get your, your quote-unquote glory snatched from yeah. you. And he, he tried so much to yeah. sort of win him over, but yeah. the qadr of Allah was yeah. that his heart was ultimately sealed. Yeah. The, the the ego was not conquerable for him, and yeah. Allah is, is perfectly just, of course. Yeah. But the Prophet's sort of approach to this. Yeah, you need to always be proactive on your side, right? Yeah. Oh, you may win some people over. There are times where I have not win people over, and it's okay. It's like, it's... Uh, and these are immoralities. Yeah. Like, sometimes you can't say, like, this is actually wrong. You yeah. shouldn't poke someone. Yeah. You shouldn't insult someone. Yeah. But... It's not the end. Is yeah. what we're trying to say. Yeah, and it's 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 out of character, right? It's, it, it takes beauty in a person to see yeah. beauty in people, as they yeah. say, yeah. right? And, and that's so something we need to work on. See yeah. the beauty in people, even in conflict, de-escalate. Yeah. Don't let the, it ever sort of turn into the stone wall of yeah. no communication. Those are all great points. I'm just re rehearsing them no, for myself. Good. I wanted to quickly mention the practical points because I know that. Yes. Uh, so now yeah. we're closing out. Now, yeah. sort of give us whatever you think is like what people shouldn't forget. Checklist yeah. for myself. Am I doing it right? Please. In terms of uh, everything we talked about, or just no, no, this the conflict. Okay, so one, you're you're you have every you have established. Let's say you've established mission, vision, values. It's been socialized to everybody, Absolutely. right? Mm -hmm. No one is above criticism. Always have uh, public and private uh, funnels of communication, right? In terms of like feedback and stuff positive or negative. Make sure your language is empathetic and understanding and not judgmental. Make sure that your more people-oriented people are face facing in the front and the people who may be more um, reactive and you know rigid and process-oriented in the back, right? Um, and this becomes a conversation of who should be on the bus and who should not be on the bus, right? Um, or, or what seat they're on on the bus as exactly, well. Exactly, yeah, what seat, right. right? Like for me, I, I've mentioned this in the team multiple mm. times and I've gotten like weird responses. Is like, if you have any questions related to anyone's performance, whatever, come to me. But, and I don't know if, you're, if you caught this, um, if you have any feedback regarding my, exp my performance, go to the board. I'm not above criticism, right? So there needs to be the, those, those vehicles, right? Um, for employees, HR process, right? Make sure it's confidential. Make sure you protect their privacy. On a That's community, how you build trust, subhanAllah. Yeah, it yeah. is. On a, on a community level, uh, town halls, um, different like uh, more condensed and focused like groups. Like we have the guardians, right? But something related to youth, something related to sisters, giving them those opportunities. Places for the pressure cooker to let out some pressure. Because sometimes it's just venting, right? right? And then when you get that vent out, then you can find the meat and potatoes. You're able to see, okay, these are the actual feedback that we can we can we can keep in mind. Um, uh, I'm just seeing if I'm missing anything else. Uh, community. I hope individual. you're forgetting some stuff. This way, I can bring you back on okay. for another episode. <laughs> yeah, that's that's pretty much it. Um, if there's policy and process, make sure that you guys use that as your parameters, right? Don't make things up as you go. If or you else, don't, you're rewarding also bad behavior. Yes. If you don't. Yes, because you accept it, being arbitrary yeah, or there's buckling a difference, to pressure. Yeah, there's a difference between calming someone out, so, calming someone someone down, and letting them go. And with seating. yeah, that's there's a difference. You need to have your parameters in place, and if you don't have that, that should be happening. Right, and then you try and improve. And don't hold someone accountable until you do it as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, what is the That's thing? It's a that horrible I time to yeah. set parameters in the middle of a conflict. Oh yeah. That, then it then it is arbitrary. Yes, and it's reactive. You know the it's idea reactive. of uh, I, I I what is it? The disciplinarian said what? Uh, I I restart my diet ten minutes after every meal. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's, that's not yeah, a diet, right? Yeah. So the same thing. Some people just set these rules as they go. Yeah, and it's like, oh, this happened. It, we overgeneralize it, and then we make a rule based off mm. of that. There's no why. There's, There's no, no why. why. There's no like, okay, but where did that come from? We're addressing a symptom, not the problem. Jazakallah for your time, Brother Daniel. I know we were we were crunching this last few minutes because Asr is coming in. Yeah. May Allah accept from you, inshallah. And I look forward to working together, inshallah, sharing with our community whatever we can. Uh, the digital community at this point. Yeah. Alhamdulillah. We're hearing some awesome feedback from everybody. We've had people in Australia ask us for like phone calls as if we know what we're doing. <laughs> we tried to share what we could with them. And we're sorry to everyone else that we were not able to uh, reciprocate and stay uh, in communications with. And I know some brothers, they warmed my heart, to be honest. When they said that this podcast had become required, uh, required listening for their groups, for their action teams and volunteers, that blew me away. And one of them said, "This podcast is the answer to our dua." And uh, uh, I, I know it's not me; I'm the host. I'm just trying to like poach all of you uh, to help us. And may Allah use you all, make you instrumental, and, and allow for me a share of that reward as well. Amen. Allahumma amin. And jazakallah khair to our team behind the scenes, uh, Doctor Amran, Brother Tayyib, Brother Sama, and Brother Yusuf Zuhni. And all of you, may Allah Azza wa Jal allow you to see the rewards for this in your life and in your families and your afterlives. Allahumma ameen. Jazakallah khayyan everybody. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.